Uh, greetings, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're just um, adding our panelists to the webinar, and we will be starting shortly. Thank you for your patience. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Yotin. Thank you for joining us. Sorry. Sorry. Um, I did the last resort, which is reboot. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good to see you. Thank you. Okay, everybody. Uh, we'll, we'll kick off um, now that we have everybody online. Um, welcome for super greetings to everybody. Um, my name is Marioni. Um, I'm with Dawn, my working partnership with uh, PAN to bring you this uh, webinar uh, together with WWF Pacific. Um, just before I hand over to our webinar moderator, I'll just very quickly go through some of the housekeeping um, uh, items. So the, the this webinar is scheduled for one and a half hours. We'll um, start with presentations and from the speakers that will go around for 45, to 15 minutes, and then we've got around 25 minutes of Q&A and comments, um, opening up to the audience to join in on a conversation on uh, this important topic uh, of data and NGRs, uh, leading into IGC-5, IGC-5, Just for those who'd like to pose comments or questions, please, we encourage you to use the Q&A box. We will be fielding questions from uh, the Q&A box. Um, and note that um, please post questions with your name. Um, we won't be fielding questions that are anonymous. So we encourage you to identify yourself when you're asking questions. The other thing to share is that we're currently um, sharing this uh, webinar on live stream via uh, um, Facebook. Um, so this is also be, being shared there. Um, there will be questions also taken from the live stream audience. So, without uh, further ado, I will hand over to our panelists and our moderator for the afternoon uh, or evening and morning for those of you on the other side of the world. Um, thank you, Lide. Over to you. You're muted. Uh, you're muted. <laughs> well, okay, let's start again. <laughs> Sorry about that. 
Um, okay, so I'm going to ask a specific greetings to all who have joined and are still joining our webinar. Uh, we welcome you to the second webinar organized by the Pacific Civil Society uh, for BBNJ. That's namely the alternative the development alternatives with women for a new era, WWF Pacific and the Pacific Network on Globalization. Uh, just a very quick recap on what is the BBNJ. Uh, it's an international agreement on conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction, currently under negotiation at the United Nations uh, in New York. It's being developed within the framework of UNCLOS, uh, which is the main international agreement, agreement governing the human, uh, human activities at sea. So why the BBNJ? The areas beyond national jurisdiction comprises about 70% of the ocean provides invaluable uh, ecological, social, um, cultural, scientific, and food security benefits to us. Um, but these areas are now uh, vulnerable to growing threats, including overexploitation uh, and the impacts already uh, visible uh, of climate change. And the increasing demand of the marine resources uh, Marine resources for food, minerals, or biotechnology only threatens to exacerbate this problem. So, why this webinar? Uh, so, as we head into the fifth and final uh, session of the BBNJ, the central debate on the legal status and gov governance, access to, and utilization of MGRs in the ABNJ remains. It's, and its underlying political issues, the politics around data and data government, uh, governance in this particular element of the BBNJ uh, raises significant questions and are critical to consider uh, the ownership or monopolization of MGR data, access to and the utilization of MGRs and data, or the eth ethical boundaries in science, research and development. And how can we ensure a robust uh, regime for MGR? that will not undermine coastal state regimes and create loopholes or incentives to misreport the location of in-situ collections. And on that note, um, I would like to quickly take you through the program of this um, afternoon's webinar or morning or your tonight. We have four speakers, uh, Tekau, uh, Dr. Sawapi, uh, Yopling and Anita uh, Gurmurti. Uh, I will introduce them before they speak. Each speaker will be given seven to 10 minutes or 10 minutes to speak. Uh, that should take us right up to the hour. And then we will open the Q and A, uh, open the floor for Q and A. Uh, so please fill all your questions in the, the Q and A and we will take it from there. And just before we end, we'll give two minutes to each um, speaker to wrap up. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Tekal Ferrari, I hope I can. Uh, pronounced your name correctly, I should have um, asked you before. Tekao is from French Polynesia. She's a consultant working primarily with the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commissioner, or OPOC as it's known, as advisor on ocean related processes at the United Nations. And in this capacity, she's continuing her working relationship with Pacific states, in particular in the UN permanent missions of Pacific small island developing states in New York. Uh, with whom for six years she collaborated on various uh, ocean related processes, including securing a dedicated uh, sustainable development goal on ocean, SAMO pathway, and the BBNJ negotiations. So, Tekao, please uh, tell us more about the instrument, the overview, uh, may provide an update on the BBNJ negotiations, uh, and your assessment of views uh, on considerations for marine genetic resources. So, you have the floor, Tekao. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for inviting me to be a panelist. And thank you for asking me to talk about this humongous topic in seven minutes. Um, so apologies, I'm just going to fly through it um, and, and try not to enter, go too much into details and try to stick to the time slot. Um, before I start, um, just to ensure that whatever I say is not an OPOC position. It's also not the PCIT's position. I'm, I'm trying to um, tell you uh, things as, as I see them and, um, and definitely not going into detail. So there's a lot of caveats to what I'm about to say. Um, but before going into um, 
I, uh, IGC-5 preparation in the current uh, zero draft and, and um, the, the discussions at play um, might be good just to set this, the stage and, and why we're talking about the BBNJ instrument. So at the root of it is, of course, um, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS, which is pretty much, um, so it's, it is the, the framework that governs all activities on oceans and the seas. At the root of UNCLOS is really this balance of interests between um, those who held that the ocean belonged to no one and those who um, believe that um, resources or what they call the stock resources um, or the resources that can be depleted must have some sort of ownership. Um, and so from there, uh, different zones were created in, in UNCLOS maritime zones and each zone have their particular um, legal regime. When we're talking about areas areas beyond national jurisdiction, A, B, and J, we're mostly talking about the high seas, which is the, the water column beyond national jurisdiction, which is governed under the regime of freedom of the high seas, where um, no one owns um, those high seas. We are also talking about the area, which is the soil and subsoil beyond national jurisdiction. And this is governed by the principle of common heritage of mankind, where what that means is it belongs to humankind as a whole. And it's administered by the International Seabed Authority. So um, going back to then um, the, the BBNJ, why, why are we, there to talk about uh, BBNJ. As I mentioned, UNCLOS is the framework that governs all, all activities on the ocean and the sea. Um, there are actually uh, other instruments that um, have a more sectoral approach. So you have, for instance, the International Maritime Organization that um, governs navigation. Uh, you have regional fisheries organization that deal with fisheries. You have um, the um, UNESCO IOC that deals with research, et cetera, et cetera. All these different sectors um, work to be really broad. Um, on silos, and there was a lack of governance, of ocean governance, including areas beyond national jurisdiction. And because of that, the international community saw um, that they could not necessarily resolve some of the big issues impacting biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. That was back in the early 2000s. And that's where they started to think that maybe there, you know, there was room to have um, a, a, a treaty that would govern um, BBNJ that would bring a little bit more um, coherence among those different sectors. So that's one of the um, an um, objective of, of the instrument. So, um, so it's, it's also best to balance the, the different interests because one of the thing in terms of governance of areas beyond national jurisdiction, including in terms of biodiversity is that you do have different interests that might collide. And you see that in the marine genetic um, resources part. Um, but before I dive into the marine uh, genetic resource part, um, BBNJ um, pretty much has as an objective to conserve and sustainably use biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction. When you have conserve, it really means uh, maintaining the, the, the ecosystems healthy so that they can continue um, providing um, their functions, which can then be used for humankind. Sustainably use mean that you can continue using those resources, those ecosystems, those, um, um, those, those areas without impacting future generation ability to also use them. Um, but to do that adequately, you need some means. So um, we're talking capacity, we're talking technology, we're talking funding, uh, but you also need to have some sort of governance. Um, so we're talking also um, decision-making, we're talking 
monitoring or talking enforcement, etc. So that's um, some of the key uh, discussions and, and uh, key characteristics um, that are being discussed in the instrument. The frame of the instrument is around four key pillars. Um, areas beyond, um, area based management tools, which include marine protected areas that these are tools to um, manage and protect areas, including um, their resources and ecosystems. You also have environmental impact assessments, which are ways to assess whether activities that will um, take place in areas beyond national jurisdiction or for some activities that will have an impact on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction um, will, can or should not uh, go ahead. You also have then um, discussion on marine genetic resources and more specifically, um, what type of mechanism or process can be put in place so that the access and utilization of those resources can generate some benefits and to whom should these be shared so that the use of that biodiversity, the genetic resources, can be as equitable as possible. But for all of this, as I mentioned before, you need means, so you need capacity, you need technology. And so one of the pillar of the BBNJ instrument is to discuss the provision of capacity and um, technology um, to two parties and maybe others. And then of course you have everything related to the cross-cutting um, elements. So that includes um, the governance. So uh, what type of decision-making, uh, what type of scientific advice um, we'll, we'll have um, and like whether or not there will be funding and how will that work, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I know I'm, I'm, I'm taking more time than I should, but in terms of marine genetic resources, so what are we talking about? Um, as I mentioned before, um, we have in the genetic resources at the root of the quote unquote issue, two regime, legal regime that are put forth by UNCLOS. The one that we've heard is the common heritage of mankind. Again, it's the regime that governs the area. So that's the soil and subsoil. Article 87 of UNCLOS determines that or provide that the area and its resources are the common heritage of mankind. For developing countries, that include marine genetic resources of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And therefore, for them, their access must be regulated and their utilization must generate benefits for humankind as a whole. On the other hand of the spectrum or on the fight or argumentation are those countries who believe that marine genetic resources or activities that are linked to marine genetic resources fall within marine scientific research. My marine scientific research is a freedom of the high seas. And therefore, um, any state can go ahead and do marine scientific research, which is conditioned. So they, they do not have to have due regard to the rights and interests of other states. But because it is a freedom of the high seas, they cannot be limited to access or to collect those resources and to conduct um, scientific research. So that was the, the root of, of, the, disc of the fight. Um, for a long time, the negotiations were really stuck on common heritage of mankind, freedom of the high seas. But uh, since IGC4, I think, um, we've kind of moved away from that fight, although the um, the, um, the conflict or the, the positioning is still very much entrenched in, in the positions and um, the, the discussions. Now in IGC-5, in the new zero draft uh, text that we have, um, 
return to the past, there is no longer um, a disagreement that um, the collection or the sampling of um, marine genetic resources should lead to benefit sharing. That's an agreement. The question now is, how far do we go in terms of marine genetic resource? Is it just those that are taken in situ, so either collected or accessed in situ? Or do we also include benefits to be shared after resources are collected ex situ, so in repositories, for instance, still in physical samples? Or do we go even beyond when those resources samples are converted into information or data, such as digital sequence information, which Katie will discuss a little bit further. But do these also generate benefits? There is currently no agreement, um, no agreement on that. Another um, issue is that of, of um, fight, if I may say, is whether or not benefits will um, include only non-monetary benefits such as capacity like trainings or invitation on cruises or access to some information or the sharing uh, of information or um, would it also include monetary benefits like for instance um, would the commercialization of a product that came from um, some marine genetic resources of A, B, and J generate um, payments of some sort to either um, a set of beneficiaries or a global fund or whatnot. There is currently no agreement um, on that, and that's um, part of the discussion. Um, so I see that, but um, so there is definitely, um, there's also some agreement that there should be a way to um, not necessarily trace, but any access, um, including collection in situ would need to be notified to the instrument, um, but then how that operates, there's still some, some discussions um, on that. Um, some other discussions that are happening now is what will be the relationship between this instrument, BBNJ, and the CBD, including the Nagoya Protocol. Um, there are currently discussions in the CBD on um, how to include and how to deal with digital sequence information, for instance. There's also a uh, discussion on the creation of a multilateral access and benefit sharing mechanism. Um, so all these are still up in the air. One um, last thing that I really wanted um, to, um, that I'm going to end up on um, is um, a joint proposal by Australia, New Zealand, Pacific Seeds, uh, Norway, and Maldives, and that's on um, the access of traditional knowledge associated with uh, MGRs of uh, areas beyond national jurisdiction. So, so this um, this proposal, which is Article 10 bis in the zero draft, um, provides that access to traditional knowledge associated with MGRs of an ABNJ should be based on free prior infor informed consent or approval of relevant IPLCs. So the IPLCs who are the holders of that particular knowledge. Um, that access may be facilitated by the clearinghouse mechanism that will be established under the instrument. And any access or utilization of that knowledge uh, would need to be agreed on, would need to be done on mutually agreed term. So that um, I think one of the least controversial um, proposals so far in the instrument, but I might be a little bit subjective um, on that. Um, so I think I went way beyond my time and I apologize. Um, I promise myself that I will not, but um, I would be happy to um, discuss more later. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Takao, for that uh, brief overview. Uh, certainly more questions than answers coming from the heading into uh, IGC-5. 
Okay, so next we'll head straight to Dr. Katie Sowapi uh, from the Rendo, from Rendova Island in the Solomon Islands. She's an ocean scientist specializing in the chemistry of organisms in the ocean and her passion for ocean conservation has taken her all over the world. She's also a founding member of the Tetepare Descendants Association. Dr. Sowapi is also part of the advisory team to the Office of the Pacific Ocean Commission, uh, supporting Pacific Island countries on the marine genetic resources component of the BBNG negotiations. Dr. Sowapi, can you please highlight some of the uh, opportunities and challenges of marine scientific research, including MGRs in the ABNJ uh, for, for small island developing states or an overview of that in, in the region? Thank you. Um, can I share my slides? Yes, you can. It's disabled. Yep. You should be able to. Um, you should be able to share now. Can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Thank you, moderator. And Bula uh, Vinaka and warm Pacific greetings uh, to you all. Um, thank you for the kind uh, and generous introduction. And thank you also for this opportunity to, um, to speak on MGRs. I was asked to speak on the interconnectedness of marine genetic resources within, um, within and beyond national jurisdictions and some of the opportunities and challenges uh, on marine scientific research on MGRs, um, including uh, in the area beyond national jurisdiction and particularly looking at it from a seeds perspective. Um, I'd like to start with um, our Blue Pacific region. So as you can see, we have, we are 98% ocean and only 2% land. We have 22 Pacific Island countries and territories, 12 million people. We are custodians of about 28 million square kilometers of ocean space, which makes up about 20% of the world's exclusive economic zones, or EEZs. Now, we know this because we have put boundaries around our EEZ, and we have also put um, boundaries around where the high seas are and the high seas pockets. But for ocean organisms and marine organisms, they often don't have boundaries. You know, the ocean is the largest uh, ecosystem. It is interconnected and it doesn't operate at all in sectors, in silos and in boundaries. Uh, it doesn't recognize or respect those EEZ and high sea pockets and, and um, um, lines that we, we put around um, our claim on. So the ocean itself is full, as we all know, of biologically and genetically diverse marine organisms. From the coastlines of our shores, my apologies, somehow this is going on a time which I didn't know was there. <laughs> so um, from our coastlines, um, out into the deep ocean, uh, from the surface of the ocean and down the water column, down into the deep uh, trenches, the seabeds, we know that, you know, it holds all forms of marine life. And these all have genetic resources and it forms what we um, have as our marine biodiversity. But when we're talking about marine genetic resources, 
We are talking about resources that have potential value, uh, as um, um, we all know. And then, you know, this could either be of ecological value or of economic value or even of cultural value for us. But we know very little about this, um, the ocean resources that we have. Most of our ocean is still very much unexplored. And I think you all know the saying that we know more about the surface of the moon than we uh, know about our ocean floor. And the key thing here is how do we get to know our ocean floor and the resources that are in there? Well, we need data and we need science. About 4%. Only about 4% of global research on marine science um, is on marine science, sorry, according to the Global uh, Ocean Science Report. And so we have, we all know that we have large data gaps on how life is distributed in the ocean. And this opportunity that marine uh, genetic resources uh, and the BBNJ provides can really bridge this gap in data that we have. The science is quite heavy uh, on the marine genetic resources, but the information that is collected will be very uh, critical in identifying and helping us uh, understand our biodiversity, the ecological connectivities, the distribution, distribution of organisms, um, and uh, it can help us develop habitat maps, marine spatial planning that can help with our ocean governance, including uh, contributions to conservation and sustainable use of ocean resources. For us in seeds and pea seeds especially, the ocean is central to our lives, you know, to our people. The ocean influences every aspect of our life. It is central to our culture and our uh, and it also sustains our livelihood. And our proximity to unexplored ocean areas, including these deep sea areas that are within and also beyond national jurisdiction and the highly diverse marine ecosystems. Um, you know, our interest in this is, is no surprise because whatever happens in the deep ocean will impact us. And so, our interest in this area is we are interested and we want to protect our neighborhood. Now, before I talk about the challenges and opportunities in marine scientific research, I just really wanted to very briefly touch on this. These are just some slides I added just before I came on. Um, and it's just to show sort of a process that marine genetic resources go through um, uh, for us to be able to, you know, connect and understand what those challenges are, I think it's important for us to, to see what deep sea science, especially within the marine genetic resources, looks like. So you would have a cruise which would go out, and often this takes quite a while to, to organize a huge expedition um, with scientists from all sorts of different uh, thematic areas, but within the ocean space. So you might have fisheries, you might have uh, microbiologists, you might have uh, chemists, you might have oceanographers and deep sea mineral experts, um, and they all go out together. And the, the sampling is done, as you see, using often with robots, uh, this is the collection in situ, which is referred to in, in the BBNJ instrument. Samples that are collected are all sorts of marine life. It can be sediments, it can be sponges, it can be soft corals, any new life that is of interest uh, could, you know, if you can have a piece of that um, um, sample, it's often quite small amounts uh, for research. Uh, and that's that's the collection in situ. Once you collect those samples and they become placed in storage or in collection, in museums, repository, the access becomes ex situ. And um, once you also start working on the samples, 
you collect the DNA and this becomes, you know, as, as a placeholder, it is currently digital sequence information or DSI. I think others will speak to that. But this information will then go to gene banks or data banks. Uh, and sometimes the chemistry is also collected, for example, micro um, molecules that could then be tested. Now, that, that's the process of utilization. So if I go back just a bit to, to the extraction, all of that starts the process of utilization. The process goes through a whole big range of you know, um, um, uh, processes. So from testing, it could go uh, through different uh, extraction and purification methods. And I just wanted to put this as, a, as, a, as an example here, a couple of cancer drugs that are, were isolated. These are not from the deep sea, but just to show an example of marine organisms that have been used to come up with, you know, like cancer drugs um, and through the process of utilization, research development and commercialization. And again, these two uh, samples, as I've said, they they not necessarily from, from, from the deep sea, but the process would be very similar. Although, you know, the, the processes that the digital sequence information go through uh, could be different. So different processes to come up with often the same product, which is a commercial product for, for um, uh, that comes out um, on a more on a commercial for commercial gains. Okay, so having just spoken about the process very quickly there, and that's uh, again a process which is very, um, you know. It takes sometimes 10, 20, 15, 30 years for you to collect all the way to get a sample sometimes. But the technology has changed so much now. So things are a lot faster, but I just wanted to, to explain that uh, very briefly. Now to the challenges and opportunities in marine scientific research. Uh, Tekao mentioned earlier, you know, with marine genetic resources, uh, capacity and tech transfer is a key. Uh, for us to, to participate, to understand, to engage in this process. Uh, and I, I'd like to pick up on that as well as one of the key things that I wanted to discuss, which is you know, looking at capacity needs, the partnerships that can enable that, and you know, building the science capacity under BBNJ. Now, you know, despite our region being 98% ocean, you know, we have some of the lowest uh, science capacity, ocean science capacity in the world, according to the Global Ocean Science Report. Um, we know almost no Pacific Islander took part in the ocean science assessment report. Um, the IPCC report doesn't have any Pacific Islanders. Uh, we don't have research vessels to actually go and do our own you know, research in the high seas. I think apart from Fiji that has a hydrographic survey vessel. Uh, and so, when we're talking about capacity, you know, even the basic capacity is often lacking for us. So just on the needs, I think this provides a real opportunity for us, this BBNJ instrument to co-create opportunities for marine research that are demand driven, that actually addresses our needs and are based on our needs. Um, and so there's a, a needs assessment that's mentioned in, in, the, in, the, in the instrument. Um, but what I'd like to uh, mention here is that, you know, as part of this, some of the key things we should do is how can we participate uh, in such research, uh, but not only participate, you know, how can we actually analyze the information to help decision making and provide critical data to support national, regional and global commitments that arise from this treaty. And, uh, you know, a lot of times these research topics that, that come to us are predominantly driven from Pacific Rim countries and developed nations. So I think for marine scientific research, often, although we give our consent, we are often, uh, um, we don't often involve, get involved in the research 
uh, itself, the cruises, although we have to give our consent. Um, and often, um, you know, publications don't include um, uh, our people. And I think under this, this um, instrument, some, some of this probably needs to change if we are to build our capacity. And I know one of the key things is, is the uh, demand-driven and um, creative processes that could really identify and address the needs and priorities of SEEDS. The second thing I'd like to mention is the partnerships and the opportunities that can arise. I think access to data is something we've um, we're going to talk about. I just am not going to really touch on that too much. Um, but you know, for us to be able to participate in this research, we need to have um, you know we need access to information. If we want to manage our resources, we need to be able to to um, uh, overcome many of those barriers um, to access and. You know, um, sometimes the whole data pipeline often becomes complex. And sometimes we, when we, we don't have the capacity, we don't get involved in the whole chain of data analysis. I think as part of this, it might be, it would be really good if we are able to build capacity and, and track the challenges and be able to also uh, manage our ocean resources for ourselves, not only for ourselves, but for the common good of the planet, because it seems like most of what we are doing in the Pacific is helping to conserve ocean resources, while those outside of us are more exploiting resources um, beyond um, you know, sustainable ways. The third and final thing, um, or, or I, I just wanted to maybe very quickly mention on funding. I mean, for us to participate, we need funding. And I think one of the key things I am starting to see is, you know, people come to us because now there's deep sea science. And my first question now is, how are you gonna support us? Who's, who's going to do this work for free for you? So I think we really need to be asking those questions. We shouldn't really just because somebody comes to us with a project saying, yeah, let's, you know, uh, partner with you. Um, can we um, put you down as a collaborator? Like, okay, great, but where's the money? And I think uh, this provides not only that challenge, but an opportunity to really work with other partners, corporate, networking and connecting with people and mentoring uh, young scientists from our region. The, the final thing I just wanted to mention is on the science capacity. And uh, again, you know, we are all moving towards how do we balance the health and wealth of our ocean? And a key thing, you know, how do we create jobs out of this? And so we, we need to, to start thinking about diversifying, you know, our sectors, so pharmaceuticals, sustainable energy, marine genetic resources, these are all areas we really do want to get into. And so um, diversification uh, of, our, of our resources need to be built on the best science, uh, scientific data and information and knowledge, uh, including our traditional knowledge. And so access to all of this, the capacity to, to engage in this uh, is really, really important. And also, this is uh, something for policymakers as well. Um, and you know, we are hoping that uh, good partnerships and approach to inclusive uh, capacity building under this in instrument, you know, hopefully, al although it's voluntary, maybe it can be a mandatory capacity building and tech transfer uh, as part of this instrument. Um, so I, I mean, be, before I stop, I just wanted to say that, you know, this is a great opportunity, this BBNJ treaty, and also the decade of ocean science is another great opportunity that can really help us improve our, our science base uh, and develop our capacity in the region. And, um, you know, I especially support 
to both seeds and our, our special circumstances. This is a quote, and this is my last slide. Sorry, I'm gonna stop talking now. Um, from, from a scientist from SEEDS, you know, uh, there was a report that came out uh, last year on interviewing scientists from SEEDS. And this is the uh, comment from one of the scientists. We don't know what's in our EEZ. We need capacity to better understand our EEZ. And then we could use that to better engage with A, B, and J. Thank you for this opportunity and the natural level. Thank you very much, Dr. Sawati. Again, more challenges that we see, but also um, really uh, asking for meaningful participation or intentional participation for pieces or for small island developing states uh, to realize the opportunities that lies within this instrument also. Uh, so our third speaker, well, we head straight into our third speaker uh, is Yokling. Um, Yokling is a lawyer and is the executive director of Third World Network, an international nonprofit policy research and advocacy organization with its secretariat in Malaysia. Yokling works on sustainable development issues with a focus on social justice and equity issues and the effects of globalization on developing countries. Um, among her current research and advocacy work are uh, issues related to trade and investment, biodiversity and community rights. Yokling will take us through the importance of ensuring equity in addressing access to digi digital sequencing information related to biodiversity and the benefits derived from such data, and the need for the Global South to have access to, their, to digital sequencing information in databases controlled by external parties and entities. Thank you, Yokling. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, can I just share screen as well, very quickly? Sure. Uh, just to say uh, greetings uh, to all of you. Uh, very good to be uh, taking part in this discussion. Uh, I was just thinking, listening to both um, um, Dr. Katie and also to, uh, to uh, Takera. Um, it, it is like listening to the discussion uh, a few decades ago when the Convention on Biological Diversity was being negotiated, because uh, back then the same uh, discussion around resources, uh, means of implementation, financing, et cetera, uh, was a very, very uh, big, big topic. So when we think about, uh, you know, what is going on now with the, with the BBNJ, it really is the same um, uh, kind of debate. So I will quickly just uh, use the slides because there are quite a few things uh, that have cropped up. Um, I, first of all, I want to start with this quote from Albert Hammond, who is part of the Third World Network team, who's been really tracking uh, biopiracy issues of physical samples uh, for many, many years. And he is working a lot on uh, uh, digital uh, sequence information and also following quite a number of the uh, negotiations going on in the CBD and also in the uh, WHO. So, uh, and this quote actually sums it all. He says that the current dominant and inequitable international sequence data system is this thing called the International Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. Uh, and this whole collaborative network, as he describes it very aptly, subsidizes Northern business and science by offering up patentable and otherwise commercially valuable sequences from around the world without benefit sharing, and also paying little to no heed to the origin of the genetic resources that this network hosts. And this is only one of many, but this is the most dominant. The reason I'm starting with this quote is because there is a lot of demand from the industry pharmaceutical, agribusiness, uh, science, even military research for open access to resources and now open access to immediate, um, in fact, one thing, obligations on uh, member states of the United Nations. When you have, if, if you have any control over uh, resources or data, you must quickly share that under different circumstances into an international system. So they want free access but once it gets into this collection, terms and conditions kick in. So when we talk about access, uh, which we have heard so far, access for the South to be able to get oftentimes to our own samples of uh, resources and to the information that comes from our own resources, then the access is closed. 
But I, I think there are two types of access here because when we talk about free access, the other side is getting a lot of free access and then they lock it up either through the use, commercialization and the use of intellectual property. And there is a provision in the draft treaty, uh, the BBNJ on intellectual property, which is actually quite worrisome and I'll come to that at the end. Uh, let me see, I'm trying to, okay. So very quickly, the whole concept of fair, uh, fair uh, equity and, uh, um, hang on, sorry. Having a bit of an issue here. Okay, so uh, fair and equitable benefit sharing uh, is a very fundamental concept. So we started with the Convention on Biological Diversity back in 1994 when it was concluded. Uh, and I think it's important because this is in a way the mother principles of what we're talking today in the BBNJ. So there are three, um, there are three very important uh, um, uh, prince, uh, objectives, which is conservation, sustainable utilization of the biodiversity and fair and equitable benefit sharing. And in the CBD, it is very clearly including transfer of technology, capacity building as benefits are both monetary and non-monetary. So to hear some of the uh, disagreements going on right now with the BBNJ is basically that the BBNJ is not really aligned to this fundamental principle about how we are going to conserve and use and equitably sh uh, benef uh, share the benefits coming from the use of biodiversity. Now, the reason this, uh, this CBD is important because this has framed uh, the Nagoya Protocol, which is negotiated, which was negotiated under the CBD, which operationalized the third objective of equitable benefit sharing, fair and equitable benefit sharing. Uh, interestingly enough, I look at the preamble of the draft BBNJ, there is conservation, there's sustainable use, but there is no mention on fair and equitable benefit sharing. And then the, the, the option about whether you use the term equity or whether you use the term fair and equitable benefit sharing comes later in the operational part of the tre draft treaty. Uh, and this is something that actually is a step back uh, if we look at it in terms of uh, putting uh, benefit sharing on an equal uh, footing with conservation and sustainable use. Now within the Nagoya Protocol and the CBD, there is a recognition, although the focus of the scope is on uh, resources within national jurisdiction, but there is recognition that there is there are many situations where there are transboundary trans resources, or there could be uh, resources which you cannot track where it has come from, the origin of those resources. And therefore, recognizing that in the Nagoya Protocol, there is provision for a global multilateral benefit sharing mechanism, where we can then collectively, which is what we see being discussed now in the BBNJ. But unfortunately, Article 10 in the Nagoya Protocol has made no progress because there's no good faith to really uh, put into place uh, this mechanism. Now, the same principles of the CBD actually guided the uh, International Treaty on Plant Genetic Resources for Food and Agriculture, which is under the FAO, what we normally call the SEED Treaty. It is about conservation, sustainable use, fair and equitable benefit sharing of agricultural resources, which are in the list within the treaty. Now, digital sequence information was put on the agenda of the CBD, many years ago, and that was really because of advocacy by civil society, indigenous uh, and local communities advocacy with, in partnership with a large number of developing countries, LDCs and SIDS. It was because of, and there was a denial in the beginning to include DSI uh, by the uh, developed countries who argue that this does not fall within the definition of genetic resources. It took us many, many years to even get the agenda item into the CBD. So now the contestation is taking place on how do you then include DSI into benefit sharing? How do we deal with the governance of DSI in an equitable manner, right? So it has been stalled. There's an impasse in the international uh, uh, seat treaty. Uh, and then we have, uh, right now we have uh, a whole uh, debate going on in the CBD, which is about the next, uh, uh, next 10 years of the future of the global biodiversity framework, because every target in the last 10 year program has not been met. And I think all of us from the states and uh, developing countries in the South, we've been part of that, that debate. And the failure of implementation of the CBD will be repeated for the Nagoya Protocol, for the International Seed Treaty, 
and also for the BBNJ, if we don't deal with the fundamental issue of equity, obligations, common and differentiated responsibility, which is a concept we don't see in the BBNJ. Uh, in fact, equity word I think only appears once or twice. So the framing of equity is not there. And, but at the same time, there is a lot of pressure for developing countries in the South to actually share resources. And the debate around uh, BB, uh, you know, uh, resources outside of natural jurisdiction, I really, you know, what was said just now was so true. Marine, all these things about high sea is that these are legal constructs for the Pacific Islands, as you have said so clearly, uh, Katie, the whole rationale of the vitality of the ocean ecosystem, ecosystem approach, it is a very different concept. There are no boundaries. It is a common responsibility with obligations. And that should be the fundamental uh, you know, understanding that we've had in, in, the, in, the, in the UNCLOS. But the common heritage of mankind comes with responsibilities. I find it very ironical that the freedom of the high seas, we started off as navigation rights, which was really a lot about piracy uh, in, the, in the days when you think about the concept of the high seas. And suddenly the concept of the high seas is pitted against a uh, common heritage of mankind, which is really, really surprising. So the state of play right now is that the DSI is an, on an impasse everywhere. And Anita will, after me, talk about why it is so important. Right now, the CBD, the struggle with putting DSI there was to say, if we don't include DSI, then everything that we uh, constructed assuming it's only about physical samples, then we will lose huge chunks of our rights to our resources and to the benefits on those resources. And if we don't have the same equitable framework for the marine resources outside of national jurisdiction, then it will be a one-way traffic of you know, extraction and there will be common heritage of mankind for the purposes of accessing those resources and information, but no reciprocal sharing across, especially with those in the Pacific Islands, right? Now, I put in the third uh, thing on the screen, which is really uh, very interesting. This is the WHO framework, not so well known on pandemic influenza preparedness. And a number of countries and some of us in civil society work together to really put in the CBD principles of fair and equitable benefit sharing into the WHO in relation to pathogens. Because a lot of pathogen samples were being collected during the, uh, the uh, H1, uh, during the avian flu. They were developed into diagnostics, into vaccines, into uh, you know, uh, all kinds of therapeutics, especially vaccines in this case. Um, and what happened there was everything became private property through patenting by the pharmaceutical industry. And we who supplied, and people died in the process you know, during pandemics and outbreaks. And those samples taken from, from, from the South were free, but then when it comes to the benefits for the diagnostics and the vaccines, we have to pay so much. And we saw this in COVID. COVID illustrated this massively. And this fundamental inequitable uh, system, I think has to be addressed. Now, where we stand in the, the CBD very quickly, major differences remain. The last meeting of the open-ended working group which is dealing with the post-2020 global biodiversity framework for the next 10 years, within which uh, the Africa group, uh, you know, fr from the beginning said, if DSI is not included, there cannot be consensus on what to do in the next 10 years. The fight there is really about taking away equity and putting into place a one-way traffic as far as resources and DSI is concerned. The last meeting in June ended in absolute disarray because it was first in, in person meeting after the uh, all the hybrid uh, challenges uh, of the last two years. So in principle, there is broad support from all the parties to say, yes, we must create a multilateral uh, benefit sharing system for DSI because how do we track origin, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this means we do not stop access for sequence information for biotech, pharma, agriculture, and other industries. So we want to have unencumbered international flow. And we, so in principle, we all want that. And we agree that in return, we will have monetary benefits through some kind of a fund to support conservation and sustainable use in the South. This is part of the discussion in principle. But when you go into the details and the positions of each of the country, you are very lucky in BBNJ, you actually have a 250 something page compilation where you can actually transparently see which countries and which blocks are taking what position. In the CBD, we do not have that luxury because a lot of the process of the United Nations in a transparent way of negotiating has also been undermined. So this is actually uh, quite a, a bit of a crisis. So the devil is in the details because where do the North actually stand 
good. As we saw in COVID at the beginning, let's all have global public goods. Let's all be in solidarity. But when it came to the reality, it was hoarding intellectual property to big pharma companies controlling you know, uh, publicly funded research. The next meeting for the CBD of the open-ended working group will be in early December, followed by the conference of parties. They hope to conclude this massive, everything is in brackets. Everything is actually uh, not decided. The whole document on, on, on uh, DSI is also uh, uh, un, un, unresolved. So whether there will be meaningful DSI benefit sharing is still an open question. And I've put uh, links to two articles uh, that Edward Hammond has written, which actually gives us a lot of the details. Now, very quickly, I, I raised the, the WHO uh, pandemic influenza preparedness uh, uh, framework because this is probably the only concrete example where benefit sharing actually materialized. And, the, and this was not easy. There was tremendous resistance, even though almost all countries in the world are CBD parties. The United States is not a party. So in the WHO, the United States tried to stop this from actually even being born. And so did all the countries in Europe, et cetera, where they have big pharmaceutical interests. In the end, we did get it because of the solidarity of the South. And solidarity of the South, not just the, the, the island states fighting for uh, the BBNJ, is so, so important. And there, the objective is to have preparedness and to strengthen. There is also an a, a international system of sharing samples, et cetera. But they agreed in that framework, there must be equal footing between sharing of the, of the viruses, including DSI, now, and also the equitable sharing of the benefits such as vaccines and antiviral. And now we, they have mechanisms in there. They've even generated uh, funding. So there's a compulsory payment by the users of the system that, that where, where, where countries have donated uh, and, and, and shared the, the, the pathogens uh, samples. Uh, so WHO gets a certain amount to run the system. And then they also uh, have a compulsory system for uh, advanced uh, access to certain percentage of pandemic response products uh, from the companies that use the system. And this is something that is actually uh, really quite useful to look at. In the WHO now, there are two uh, negotiations going on, all around pathogens, and a lot of it is around DSI, because that is really what you need. All you need is the, the sequence information, and from there, you can actually do diagnostics, you can actually have vaccines uh, developed, et cetera. So they don't even need physical samples. Uh, and which is why the governance of DSI is so crucial, so controversial and unresolved in every uh, process. Now we see a very interesting inclusion of DSI in the definition uh, of genetic uh, marine resources within the BBNJ and that is actually a step forward, but the governance and the sharing, uh, you know, I, I, it'll be interesting to see what's gonna happen next week. These two uh, tracks going on in the WHO is really also about uh, equity and the word equity comes up again and again, right? Now, I want to just end by saying uh, I have some concerns. If I've, I've put the draft BBNJ Article 12 entitled Intellectual Property Rights here on the screen and look at what the CBD Article 16, the only place that we, we see the term intellectual property is actually under the larger framing of access to and transfer of technology. And there is very, the wording is very interesting. This was a very, very difficult negotiation to get to this language, that the parties recognizing that patents and other intellectual property rights may have an influence on the implementation of the convention, shall cooperate to subject the national law, um, is subject to international law and national law to make sure that these IPR are supportive of and do not run counter to the objectives of the convention. This is a very different wording from what we see in the BBNJ which says parties shall respect. The supremacy is given to intellectual property rights and also to confidential information, which has no definition. In the beginning of, uh, you know, in other treaties, you know, it started off by saying confidential business information, trade secrets. But in the uh, protocol, Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety under the CBD, that was where confidential information crept in. And it could be anything. In the biosafety protocol negotiations, they try, industry tried to say even the address of the GMO developer should be confidential information. Maybe they were afraid of protests outside the office or something to that degree. So it is very worrisome. What, who defines what confidential information is? And here it actually, the supremacy of intellectual property and confidential information protection is actually put on top, even though there's some balancing and it specifically talks about WIPO and WTO. This is actually quite uh, worrisome. Traceability, very, very important. In the Nagoya protocol, use triggers benefit sharing. 
and there is a provision for some kind of tracking and tracing through the disclosure of origin, disclosure of evidence of prior informed consent, and also benefit sharing terms. And this can be in checkpoints, it can be a patent office, it can be a, a product regulation uh, a place, it can also be a research approval uh, um, a checkpoint. It's up to countries to identify them. So tracking and tracing is important, otherwise we will only have extraction and no accountability and no uh, equitable benefit sharing. I'll stop there, thank you. Thanks, Yoclin. That was very, uh, also very worrisome, worrisome, worrisome to just listen to the, the politics around that that are happening in, in different uh, negotiation, negotiating uh, platforms or different instruments. Um, we will go straight into Anita since we're almost uh, we're eating up time. Uh, Anita is a founding member and exec, exec, executive director, excuse me, of IT for Change, where she leads research on the platform. Uh, economy, data, and AI governance, democracy in the digital age, and feminist frameworks on digital uh, justice. Anita also serves as advisor and expert on various bodies, including the UN Secretary General's 10 member group in support of the technology facilitation mechanism, including other, other forums uh, on algorithmic governance. Anita will take us through uh, right through to access to and community driven data platforms as alternatives to the privatization of data in the control of corporations and big states. Thank you, Anita. Thank you so much. I am very cognizant uh, of the time. Am I audible? Yeah. Okay, I'll continue. So what I'll do is speak a little bit after those uh, stellar presentations. Um, I think my job is perhaps easy, but I draw attention to the big data paradigm and take us a little bit through what confronts us when we actually think about digital sequence information and biological resources and how they get recoded in the form of data, digital data, and what that actually means with respect to questions for equity, benefit, uh, and public interest. Um, what we need to understand is that big data sets uh, in economics, there is a term called option value. Option value is a term uh, that's pretty interesting that you may not necessarily know what the use of a particular resource is at, at this point in time, but you tend to hold it because you believe that there might be possibility of future use. So big data uh, and the raison d'etre of digital capitalism is to hold big data in order to answer questions not yet pertinent, but may become very important in the future, which is why big data is uh, property. It is locked up and it uh, allows you as you hold more and more data and as you become the first mover, you know, in a particular arena to recombine data in a different, uh, you know, in different, different ways to increase the possibility of generating analytical insights. And then of course, using that to make something that becomes proprietary. Correspondingly today, uh, not just um, uh, natural resources or biological resources, but also developments in IoT, uh, in the internet of things and related technologies allows you to combine data in ways that um, release insights and intelligence that are phenomenal. So your physical environment, your social environment, and your smart connected objects create for you a new basis through which you can define knowledge. And this is really what we need to understand is the transition that is at a whole of economy level. And in many ways, it renders many of our global rule systems um, partly anachronistic and sometimes even redundant. And that's actually the fight that Yokling was describing in, in the ways in which the DSI debates have kind of paralyzed, you know, uh, global negotiations. So obviously, Big Pharma wants to reorganize its research around data analytics. I mean, uh, no surprise that. And um, that's because earlier you used to have a trial and error method in the lab, right? Today, I think, um, I mean, in even just nine years ago, 10% of medicines in development ever reached uh, patentability. But today, what you can actually do, and Dr. Jervik's lab says that 
it just takes eight seconds to do what used to take months to do before. So that's actually the power of uh, marine and oceans data being put through drug discovery in AI-based uh, models. Now enter synthetic biology. So you actually have synthetic biology meeting AI models, and this really uh, gives you unprecedented ways by which you actually move paradigmatically through high throughput data measurement and collection systems that generate the exact large scale data sets you need to arrive at generalizations. So earlier you had to collect these samples, physically transport these samples. Just imagine the logistics involved today through images, electronic data records, and what have you, you could actually analyze. You could first build, you can first build a large data set and optimize the design of synthetic biological products. And this is all about the meaning of materiality, right? So from the natural to artificial models to new forms of rematerialized biology, you're actually talking about creating in some ways, uh, new resources, almost playing God, you know? And this actually is uh, amply illustrated by uh, this particular program. I mean, many of us have heard of Deep mind, you know, this the ways in which uh, machine defeats the best chess player, right? And Deep Mind has, with its latest program, Alpha Fold, shown that it can predict how proteins fold into 3D shapes. And this is a very, very complex process that is fundamental to understanding the biological machinery of life. And so this is how it is. And of course, DSI is not bad news at all. And as uh, our scientists on the panel today told us, we have been able to really have breakthroughs even in, uh, for instance, uh, treatment of uh, or cancer thera therapeutics, right? So what we actually see is that the crisis actually occurs in the realm of rules. The rules that govern biological resources are simply inadequate to deal with the data and AI-enabled rematerialization of biomedical resources. Although technically data is non-rivalrous, that is, if you know, if you use it, that doesn't deplete the use. For me, technically this is true, but under current de facto regimes, it is locked up, right? Because you have these big monopolies controlling data and locking them up because of confidentiality trade secrets and what have you. Open data systems that are supposed to support research, uh, you know, support uh, smaller research labs, developing countries are often co-opted by big corporations and they are able to use the data that they already hold to kind of nuance and deepen their AI by using these open data sets. So it's exactly like social capital. You know, if you have social capital, you have financial capital, then you can leverage additional capital. So that's the way the logic works and therefore it seldom benefits smaller firms or uh, developing country research institutions or public institutions. So all of this um, also basically uh, raise an important question about equity and fairness, capabilities, you know, what technology transfer even means when data is freely flowing across borders and there is absolutely no regime in order to control that. And the infrastructural support, the scientific infrastructural support that you need become digitalized, right? So then what does it actually mean when you don't have the raw material of data, neither do you have the AI models as developing countries. So how do you first generate that data locked up in private coffers? And how do you then build the AI models in your scientific establishments to use that data? So you're actually very stuck and, um, even as we are fumbling in developing countries, FTAs and trade rules become the instrument through which richer countries are forcing developing countries to part with their data. So free flows of data is leading to demands for freer flows of data. So that's actually a paradox. And in this, actually, there is a fragmented system of rules, which has already been explained in different ways by others who spoke before me. There is indeed also a move to privatize stewardship regimes, community ownership regimes, but many of these work very well in, in, in the countries of the North. And these are also very often multi-stakeholder systems where, for instance, a rich country like, let's say, Switzerland, 
will cooperate with the WHO, which will set up this WHO bio hub facility. And this system is primarily beneficial to people who are already uh, well endowed, you know, with the research capabilities, etc. And this entire process of sequencing, storing, preparing, sharing, and all of this is extremely complex and developing countries fall behind. And that is why the Africa, African region spoke very, very aptly and very clearly about how without a multilateral DSI system, they simply cannot actually reach any conclusion because they are very clear that this is about the future. It's not about today and it's about the future. And how can uh, you know, the African region simply write away their future through some kind of uh, you know, implicit mechanism of privatized DSI management, right? So that cannot happen. We also have, uh, as Yokling pointed out, the International Health Regulation 2005 review that is taking place now. And we do have to compare what the uh, committee reviewing COVID-19 said, which is, you know, and it, it's quite chilling, they recommended that state parties should really readily share real-time information, but did not at all say anything about what the uh, review committee said earlier in Ebola outbreak about how samples and sequence data should be balanced, that is the sharing of data should be balanced with benefits uh, distribution as well. So today increasingly the silence on benefits you know, is really what we should be watching out as a committed uh, civil society. And this discourse is blatantly shifting towards legitimizing datafication for private capture. Also, we are just about beginning to understand how natural ecosystems are integrated with financialization and digitalization through crypto carbon initiatives run by big tech companies to facilitate micro payments of carbon credits using crypto tokens, basically trading people's resources, forest resources in the global south as options for future offsets. Very often they say they're including the local community and they're also issuing tokens to the local community, but all of these, this means nothing because very often uh, the current regimes on cryptocurrency prevent uh, people from trading in uh, you know, certain jurisdictions. So what about communities, indigenous populations in these jurisdictions? I mean, buying these crypto tokens is not going to see a better future for them, but you, know, you really are indulging in greenwashing and green grabbing, right? So two problems are unique to data, and I'll just take uh, two, three more minutes to conclude. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm rushing. But I, I do think that we are ending soon. So, but this is very important from a big data perspective. And I want to put that on the table here. The question here is not only limited to traditional knowledge and fair compensation, as we used to talk about, but it is about science and technology itself. My data or data originating in a particular source community is contributed to a pathogen pool. And therefore, we used to argue in the good old days of you know, discussions around malaria that, you know, developing countries need to benefit. And if pathogens are collected from a sample in a particular jurisdiction, you better make sure that those drugs go back to those jurisdictions. But today, it's extremely difficult, you know, when we talk about big data pools to actually isolate source and provenance. And even if you could do it, it's simply impossible when you combine data to produce a particular product or an innovation to say that, uh, data can actually be, that data cannot be used in research for the discovery of, let's say, treatment of another disease, right? So uh, what you actually see in the big data conundrum is the fact that it is an informational governance challenge. It's not a material governance challenge. You're not really confronted with the question of how do you govern the oceans? How do you govern pathogens? How do you govern biological or biomimetic resources? What you are confronted with is how do you govern the information about these resources? So we have to do a mental shift here and online digital rep repositories are um, actually intangible public or common pool good and data has to be treated uh, exactly like the oceans, you know, data has to be treated as belonging to common a common resource, a common pool resource, the commons of humankind. The second is that the monetary sharing of benefits from the use of DSI have extraordinary difficulties to go back and share with communities. You know, like the PIP framework, at least you can 
trace back the sources and put the money. But actually, we need to now think about benefits at a global level and not really benefits at a highly localized level. This also means, and I conclude with this, and this is where questions of regulation need to go beyond the fragmentation into a nested approach, right? So what is a nested governance approach to big data? Firstly, we need multilateral rules for data, collection, sharing, use, and what are the ethical and normative foundations? And you might even cons consider a global data constitutionalism where you outlaw at the global level um, you know, certain uses of data. You should clearly say that data cannot be used as a killer switch during war, right? These things have to be articulated. Based on this global model, we also need sui generis systems for domains like health, domains like, you know, for instance, biological resources. And we need such multilateral rules also to reaffirm that if the oceans, for instance, belong to humankind and not to any one person, the data about the oceans also belongs to everyone, right? So that needs to be asserted through this regime. The amount of effort already invested by the FAO, the WIPO, the WIPO, and the CDD in the space of DSI already suggests that these organizations may be well positioned to collaboratively address the governance gap. And while we talk about accessibility and discoverability and visibility of what kind of data sets are important, it's vital that we discuss benefits for humankind with careful attention to who are the relevant communities and indeed, if source and provenance cannot be established or traced, we need to actually think about what is the meaning of democratization of benefits. We also need to pay attention to the harms. What is intellectual property effectively doing in the age of data? Can we just dismantle the system? Of course, this is not part of the CBD rules or the C treaty you know, that uh, Yokling spoke about, but it is very important considering that we don't have a binding treaty on uh, corporations. And we need it badly because governance reg regimes internationally for businesses connect back to questions about monopolization, runaway financialization, and therefore the responsibility and obligations aspect that Yokling spoke about is crucial. Then in the nested approach, we have national data laws which are needed to manage data as a resource. And this would mean what big pharma, big labs, cannot do in my country. You know, this is what Dr. Katie spoke about. Don't come to me and sell something to me as an opportunity. Tell me exactly how it benefits my country, right? So in all our public-private partnerships, we should actually have ways by which data public goods or digital public infrastructure that is coming to us through these private partnerships are not creating new dependencies. We don't want to be dependent. We want to be autonomous, right? As countries, as communities. And finally, when we create international and national stewardship rules for community-based management of resources, we really have to think about rules of not just inclusion, but also rules of exclusion. What cannot be done when you create an open source networked community is very, very important so that if we have created something for fisher people, for small farmers, and those working within agricultural systems managed uh, outside of the capitalist system, we need a system to distribute collective agency and collective benefits, right? So rules of exclusion and stewardship, uh, you know, based um, rules are very, very important. And I stop here. Thank you so much. Thanks, Anita. Uh, you've challenged us with a lot of um, um, uh, things to consider and think about uh, concerning data. But I think one of the things that stands out is the privatizing, privatization stewardship of regimes, which is very concerning. And I think it wraps up um, very well uh, the other three, four, uh, three panelists. We have run out of time um, to, uh, to everyone. Uh, you posted your questions and it's been answered. Uh, so I'm just going to ask the, I'm so sorry, um, to everyone who also wanted to ask questions later, but uh, we've reached time. Uh, I think the information has given us been, was overwhelming, and but also very informative and also maybe things to consider moving forward to IGC-5 uh, for our um, negotiators uh, at the BBNJ. Uh, but if uh, I think we'll just do a wrap up now, uh, we could have two minutes if 
panelists have to, uh, things to add on to what they had presented. We'll give you two minutes, give you two minutes to wrap up and then we'll close the, the session. But thank you so much. Uh, I think Dr. Katie, do you want to, Dr. Sawati, do you want to go first since you have a urgent schedule? Um, I, I don't have much else to add. I think um, what I just wanted to say is particularly for, for MGRs, um, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's really about, usually about the capacity as, as, as a benefit for us, because if we want monetary benefits that could come after a long, you know, chain of research work. Um, and the way I see it is particularly under this instrument, you know, we could really, really ask for, you know, our needs. What, what are our needs that, you know, should be addressed and uh, what kind of capacity should, should we require to participate? And, and this should not only be about the science capacity, it should also be about, you know, the legal capacity, about the institutional capacity, support towards all of that so we can actually you know, implement this. There's no point in signing up to a treaty if we can't even start to implement it because we just don't have the capacity and the, the, the resources to do this. So I think capacity as a benefit is, is a great place to start as well if we are really looking at benefits from NGRs. Thanks. Thanks, Dr. Sawapi. Tikal, do you want to go next? Uh, thank you. Um, I'm not going to add much because then it will take us to tomorrow morning. Uh, <laughs> I would like to thank the panelists. It was very informative um, hearing uh, other views. Uh, the BBNJ instrument is, is definitely a difficult process um, and as you must have uh, understood by now, there are so many interests, um, many are competing. Um, and so, well, at the same time, we want to have a robust um, instrument and many delegations say that they do want a robust instrument. Um, all have different views on what robust means. So how are we going to bring everybody um, equally unhappy, um, but happy enough to sign on the treaty so that um, as many countries as possible or as many parties um, sign on to the instrument so that it become as, as, or tend to be as universal as possible. Um, so that will be the big um, challenge, I think, um, in the next um, IGC. So we'll have 10 days um, to make magic. So, um, yeah, we well, should uh, send our, uh, all our best wishes to our negotiators who are working really hard um, to close the text. Thank you. Thanks, Tikal. Are you clean? Um, just, I, I guess just to wrap up in the sense that, you know, following, picking up on a couple of things that uh, Anita said and listening to the, 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 the discussions, we, what 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 is being attempted in the BBNJ um, and Dr. Katie, I think summed it up very well. Uh, exactly what was being demanded and asked for by the South uh, as a matter of international cooperation in the CBD. It started back in the 80s, um, and marine resources is a very key part of the CBD implementation. So it is the failure of implementation of the multilateral treaties that we are confronting with today. The means of implementation on, on capacity building and the fi enough financial resources, uh, even the right technology that needs to be shared, they have not actually materialized really effectively. Uh, multilateralism, frankly, is at a low ebb, but we cannot give up because these, what we're talking about needs, needs so badly 
multilateral solutions, whether it's to say certain things cannot be done because they're not acceptable, to push back on you know, the privatization and the monopolies by a few big companies. We don't even talk about how many companies in the world control what, we're talking about how many individuals in the world control what. And many of them come from the big data community, you know, where the, the so much resources are being generated. So then when we turn back and look at what we need in the Pacific or any part of our world, uh, we still need those fundamental things. So I think the challenge really, uh, and the BBNJ actually has gone further than what one could expect. It's been many years. Um, so let's let's get together. But I would say, if we cannot implement the treaties we already have, which had a better chance in terms of the outcome and, and, and more international solidarity 20, 30 years ago, uh, perhaps what we would not want to see coming out uh, in the BBNJ is um, hope that doesn't come with implementing mechanisms. Uh, let's, let's, let's work together to make sure that that can happen. And all the best to, uh, to all the negotiators. Uh, uh, let's, let's work together. There's a lot to do uh, in and outside of any treaty. Thank you. Anita. Yes, just a small, uh, I, I was not going to say anything, but I saw a question addressed to me. Um, I think that rules of exclusion uh, in respect of, uh, data uh, are very vital. So let me give you an example. So you have a global public goods alliance. Now, data is a kind of a resource where with network advantage, you kind of become the kingpin, right? So if you access as a big tech company, a open repository of data, the ability you have to perfect your AI model is far higher than a person who's starting out, you know, as a startup, to actually uh, imagine an AI model. So what this effectively means is free riding. So you actually have this pool and then you kind of, just because of your network advantage and because you nobody has told you to share your data through you know, mandating it by law, you get away. And therefore rules of exclusion become important in these common pools. Let's take also a second example. When public health or public education systems put out their data, take the example of India, public education data from the classroom to the student to teachers and you know the entire school system is beneficial to a big ed tech company like Baiju's, right? It's not necessarily beneficial to the school system itself. So what really happens is you have to put the brakes there on what kind of data may be shared under what conditions, should there be compulsory licensing of the AI developed by private companies through use of public data sets? All of these do not at all refer to rules of inclusion in the traditional sense of common property resources. They refer to, in a peculiar and sui generis way, the ways by which data, big data sets are locked in this internet network-based advantage and therefore rules of exclusion become extremely vital. I hope I have explained this clearly. Well, thank you so much, Anita. And that brings us to the end of our, our discussion today. And thank you so much to all the panelists. Uh, but we do apologize for not giving enough time for question and answer, uh, answer time, because they are very uh, pertinent topics and discussions. Uh, but let's continue this critical engagement. Um, and let's push for, for these types of engagement, uh, even in the lead up to uh, IGC-5, or even after IGC-5, uh, let's keep pushing for these uh, engagements because it's still very important for us. It is, we are talking about the ocean and it is, the ocean is us in the Pacific as we as we like to say. And so with that, uh, I would like to say thank you so much to, to our panelists and to all that have joined and asked your questions. Uh, and can we ask the panelists to please just stay on for just five more minutes uh, and we will uh, wrap up. Thank you so much, everyone.
Okay, we're just trying to uh, re remove all the others. Um, Issa, thank you so much. I'd like to thank all of you uh, very much. I know that we had a little bit of uh, last minute things to add into our uh, concept paper and also uh, talking points and also our clashing schedules and timetables and um, itineraries. Uh, but I think this is a, a time I would like to thank you all uh, for, for making time uh, to be part of this webinar. Uh, and if you want, we can share your, if you agree, we can share your, your presentation to all uh, that uh, registered for the event. Um, and uh, also, Sorry, if, um, there's one more, if, if you're comfortable.